Hi, everyone. It's Leanne West, and I'm president of the International Children's Advisory Network. I just want to welcome you today to Ask the Experts with Anthony Chang. First, I'm going to let Dr. Anthony Chang introduce himself, and then we'll go to Katerian Brage. Good morning, everyone. I'm a, a practicing uh, children's heart uh, subspecialist or specialist, and good to see everyone. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kateri Monet Kelly, and I am a translational scientist at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Rage Garofalo. I live in San Francisco, and I run clinical trials for, um, for sick children. Awesome. So um, I don't know if any of the kids have a question right off the bat. But if not, I thought I would let maybe Kateri talk a little bit about what, um, what you do in your daily activities. Does anyone have a question? All right, Kateri, why don't you start and just tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure, good morning again, everyone. So um, again, my name is Kateri Monet Kelly and I am a translational scientist. So translation science is uh, one of the youngest uh, sciences within the translational science area, and it has a boundless, um, I like to say, area in which you can work in. We had the opportunity to do what we call work within bench to bedside, bedside to community, and then back to the community itself. So I have a quick image that I want to share with you all just so that you can visualize um, what that is. Abby, is it possible to get sharing capabilities? Yes, okay. I'm sure it is. Let me. If not, I can just drop it in the chat if that helps as well. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to have to make you a co-host. Is that okay? No okay. problem. So in the meantime, one of the things that has always been helpful for me during this process of becoming a translational scientist is to remember one of my favorite um, quotes. And that quote is from Dr. Seuss. You have brains in your head, you have feet, in your shoes, you can steer yourself any direction you choose. And that is exactly what translation science is. You can go from any point within science that you've ever thought of and make a difference. So I'm going to show you an image of what translation science is. Possibly, maybe not. <laughs> okay, here we go. So in this DNA helix, you all have the opportunity to see what the characteristics of a translation scientist is. And so it says translation is the process of turning observations in the laboratory, clinic, and community into interventions that improve the health of individuals and the public from diagnostic, diagnostics rather, and therapeutics to medical procedures and behavior changes. The professionals involved in this process, like myself, we are called translation scientists. And so, okay, Kateri, you've told me this long definition. What does that mean? I always break it down into this. Are you a person who likes systems thinking? Do you like things to be in order? Are you a person that seeks resolve? You would be a great person to be a translation scientist. Are you a rigorous researcher? Well, I'm not really sure. I don't do research yet. I'm only 12 years old. Where are you a person who likes to ask a lot of questions? You want to know why. You ask the 15 whys. Well, why is this? And how is this? That's a great characteristic for a translation scientist as well. Are you a skilled communicator? Are you a person who likes to talk to people, likes to explain the whys? That's a great and a very much so needed skill as a translation scientist. Are you a domain expert? Are you a person who likes to hone down into the minute of a subject to determine what exactly creates something? How can it change? How can you make a difference? You're a domain expert in something. 
that's a great characteristic for a translational scientist. What about process innovators? Do you like to see something from point A to Z, but then realize, hey, I can get from A to Z faster from going from A to C to Z versus going A, B, C, D. If that's something that you like, I think that would also be something you would enjoy. Are you a team player? You like to work in groups. You like to solve problems together. This is also something that you can do in translation science. And one of the favorite things that I enjoy as being a translation scientist is crossing boundaries, having the opportunity to communicate and collaborate with people across different disciplinary aspects and doing research that can benefit not only myself, but those disciplines as well. Those are all characteristics that make a great translation, translational scientist in as I have worked in the field for a little bit over 15 years, my background originally started as a student who was interested in pre-med. I did research within the labs starting out in high school. I worked at LSU School of Medicine um, from age 14 until age 22. And I did everything from clean um, animal cages to actually working in the lab and doing the translational research myself as a microbiologist. Um, you have the opportunity to present a question and talk to that resolve, whether it be working in a lab, working in public health, which is something that I'm doing right now, working in academia, which is also something I'm doing right now, or even lobbying for the rights of individuals, which is something that I've done in the past. This is all translation science. You have the opportunity to do anything that you could ever imagine. And remember, as Dr. Seuss says, any direction you choose, that's where you can go. So remember, even if you know you are interested in the sciences, you may not know exactly where in the sciences you want to go, translation science has a spot for you. I love it. Does anyone have any questions for Kateri? Y'all don't be shy, it's your chance, you know, you can ask anything, um, speak up and Valeria, I see you've joined us, yay, Amal, go ahead. Um, I have a question on something you said pretty, you said that you're working in public health right now. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on how you're doing that or like what exactly you're doing? Yeah, definitely. So at Northwestern, I work in the Center for Community Health. And in this center, we work directly with um, the city of Chicago, but we also work with outlying areas within Illinois. And I work directly with the public health institutes um, within the county and the state to create um, policy changes. So um, most specifically and recently, I've been working on COVID-19 vaccinations, and now I am also going into policy um, for policy implementation, rather, to decrease um, overdosing in adolescence. And so in that aspect, I am teaching not only clinicians and public health practitioners of the uh, cellular damage that the drugs cause, but also teaching the families, teaching the professors, the students, as well as the families, how these drugs, when they are um, brought into the community, what they can actually cause and the type of harm that they can cause, but also having um, tools and aids to provide to students as well as instructors and families specifically how if someone does specifically choose to use a drug, what to do in those cases to keep themselves safe. We know there are some people who are always going to um, have a problem with drug usage. So in that manner, I want to make sure that if they do have to use the drugs and so they are able to stop using them, that they know there is a way to check the drug to ensure its safety and that they aren't actually putting something more damaging into their body. So that's one of the things that I'm doing right now in public health. Um, in addition to that, I also work alongside um, a group called SAGE in the Alzheimer's Association, where we work with healthy individuals as they're aging and to ensure that they um, have the best quality of life through the end of life. Awesome, thank you so much. Of course. Wonderful. Yeah.
Karen, go ahead with your question. Oh, hi. Yeah, I was wondering about um, where do you think the gaps are around funding translational science? Can you speak um, to that? Yeah. So because translation science is a, again, one of the youngest um, fields in science, we also have our hands. I like to say we are the children who like to put our hands in everything in the scientific realm or in the um the spectrum of science. And so oftentimes um, funding is limited in what we say the dissemination process. So once we do the hard work in the actual labs, taking that information and bringing it to the community, there's often a gap of funding in that, which is something um, we are working on, but also reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing today, like partnering with partnering with organizations like I can, where I have the hard science, I have the data, but I'm coming out of my office, coming out of my lab to talk to someone who wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to learn about translation science or the research that we're doing at Northwestern or the research we're doing at the NIH. So one of the levels um, that we are missing funding is the translation level. And I will say at the earlier um, educational piece, so in this piece as well, so within this age group. And then also, I would say there is funding missing um, or funding that can be, be increased in the engagement aspect of it. So in addition to the education piece, engaging individuals at the uh, conception or the recruitment level of having individuals have a seat at the table, be stakeholders at the earlier stages of the translation process of sitting down, talking with whether it be um, bench scientists or whether it be large organizations that are doing the research, having people from the community in which they serve actually have a voice at the early or the onset of the research process. So those are two areas where I see there is a significant lack of funding, but the funding is due to the lack of engagement as well. So if we can um, solve the engagement piece and the communication piece, I think the funding will also come from there as well. That's great. Um, all right, does anyone else have a question? You can always put questions in the chat too. Um, if you don't want to speak up, either way is okay. Um, but if there are no more questions right now, I thought I would let Braj talk a little bit about what she does. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for hopping on so early in the morning for you. So what I do is I run clinical trials in, in children. And so a clinical trial is where a drug company will take um, a drug that they have taken through development so they'll, they'll start in the lab. So sometimes um, if you're in any science classes at work where you're using pipettes and you're creating all different things in the lab and making them bubble and explode. And so we take it from the very early part of the lab and then we will um, test it all along the way um, of, in the, the life cycle of what we call the, the entire duration of that drug. So then we, we start testing it in animals. So we'll, we'll test it in mice and rats to see how it responds and to see how high of a dose we can go before we start seeing some side effects. And then we will move into what we call the clinic, which is going into the hospital or um, your doctor's office. And then we'll, we'll start testing our drug in people so that we can see how does it, we know how it interacts in the mice and the rats. So now we wanna see if it has the same interaction in people. And then we will test it in that particular um, um, in that particular disease area. So um, in the area that I work in, so I work in, in oncology, which is cancer. And so we will test our drug in patients that have that particular cancer. And um, tying back into what Kateri does, which is so important, um, especially in finding the right treatment. So part of translational medicine is when you have a certain disease, you have certain um, cells that will um, that create that disease, and then we make medications that will actually um, attack and, and prevent that, that particular cell from, from multiplying and eating all your good cells. So we depend on um, people like Kateri to do their work so that we know exactly 
what kind of medication we need to create and where it needs to go so that we can treat the disease. So that's essentially what, what I do. And then in the, when we take it into a clinical trial, this is a drug that we have identified that we think is going to work. We understand what kind of side effects that we can expect. And so it's before the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration, who approves all of our drugs. So it's before they've um, formally approved it, but we have the quote unquote approval to do our testing. So they know that we're testing um, our drug for, for the disease that we're testing it for, where we're testing it, with whom we're testing it, everything. They know everything about our drug. And then if we find out at the end of our, our study, so we also call it a clinical study. So if at the end of our, our study, after we've collected all of the data and then we've looked at it to see what it really means to us, then if it looks like um, it works in the disease and the, um, the age of the patients that we're, we're studying, then we will um, submit all of it to the FDA in what we call a new drug application. So it's essentially us asking the FDA to approve our drug based on all of the data that we've collected. And then if you're really lucky, they will say yes. Um, part, of, part of research is that um, you can often spend years working on a drug and there's a good chance that it won't work for whatever reason, and then you have to start over. Um, and, but it's, it's incredibly exciting and gratifying when you've worked on a drug from its entire creation to see when it gets approved by the FDA and knowing that it's gonna be um, helping patients in that particular disease area. So that's what I do. And I set these clinical trials up um, all over the world. So I, sitting from my desk here in San Francisco, I get to go to Australia and New Zealand and I get to go to Japan and I get to go all over Europe. Um, and in some cases I've been able to go all over Latin and South America. Um, and so it's, it's very interesting. So very similar to Kateri. So Kateri, I'm gonna keep referencing you because you hit on all the, the high points of, of science. So um, for, to do my role, it, it definitely helps to have a background in science because in, in that respect, you have an understanding of the drug that you're working on and how it works, but you also have an understanding of the disease that you're working on and how it impacts the body. And all along the way, you're looking at um, different components, different pieces of data um, or information so that you can figure out, are you on the right track with the development of your drug? So I personally do not have a degree in science. I have my bachelor's in journalism and I got a master's in counseling psychology. I fell into research completely by accident when I was in grad school doing a, um, doing a, a clinical study in the, psych, uh, the psychology area, looking at women who had been newly diagnosed with gynecologic cancer. So cancer that happens from the waist down. And it was through that research that I decided that I really loved research. So very similar to what Kateri says, if you're curious, if you like getting into all the details and figuring out how the pieces fit together and then taking the pieces apart to understand what they all mean, you, you can do clinical trials. And if you really like working with a team that has very different members um, where they all come together and they all have their own area of expertise. So I work with people who are experts in data collection and who are experts in their medical field and who are experts in understanding how to work with and communicate with the FDA and who understand um, how to analyze the data. They're called um, statisticians. They are gurus with numbers. And one day I, I hope that I can understand half of what they do. But you end up working with um, what we call subject matter experts, and they make up your entire team so that when you're developing and um, implementing your clinical studies, they're right beside you, helping to guide you and making sure that all of your systems work, that your drug is um, at the site and ready for the patients to take, um, and that are helping you collect the data and understand it as you're, you're looking at it. So being able to work with a team is is really important, but
but there's also times where you get to work a little bit independently and you get to do a lot of problem solving. And so there will be a time, for example, where, and this happens every single time we run a trial, that we have a problem with drug, that the patient is at the site, they're ready to take their first dose, and for whatever reason, one of our systems isn't working and we can't dispense the drug to them. And so you, as what we call a clinical trial manager, you will have the opportunity to have to problem solve and figure out how do I get the drug to the patient so that they can get on their way and they don't have to sit at the doctor's office for another two hours while you figure out how to get it. And so it's, it's those types of problems that I won't say are good problems, but they really force you to think and figure out what's the right thing to do. And then if we, if we go down that path, if we make that decision, is it the right one? And what does that mean later on for the data collection and making sure that you can always find a trail of everything that you're doing? So we call that an audit trail. And what that means is that you can show from start to finish that you have followed the process correctly and that it is um, that you can reproduce that process too to show that it works. And so part of um, what we do in, in clinical research, everything has to be documented. Our saying is, if it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. And that's the, the most important part. And um, in working with the FDA, we are um, what we call very heavily regulated. And what that means is that the FDA has numerous rules and regulations that we have to follow. And in addition to following all of their rules and regulations, we also have um, at my company what we call standard operating procedures or SOPs. And so we also have to follow those so that everything that we do is repeatable, is documented, and is done correctly and in, in line with what um, the, the FDA is looking for. So I really love what I do. Um, I, the fact that I, I get to help um, children, so I work in with kids that are either six months old all the way up to 17. And they all come to, um, to the clinical trial with a different perspective um, and a different need because when you're six months old, you're still a little baby. But when you're 17, you have an idea of the world around you and how your disease is impacting you and your relationships. And so for me, I really enjoy being able to, to help problem solve for the parents with their young babies and then with the, the teenagers and the adolescents as they try to navigate um, their world with their disease and make sense of it. So, and the last thing that I'll say is um, in terms of doing what I do is you can do it from anywhere in the world. So I happen to work from home. So I get to be with my dog every single day. I have a window that I get to look out every day. It's wonderful. And there are some days if I don't have to get on the camera, I will confess I'm still in my sweatpants. So you can work from anywhere as long as you have an internet connection and a phone. You can do your work. And there are so many different options, whether you work for um, a large company like uh, I do, you can work for a very small company, you can work for um, what we call a contract research organization, which is a, a large company that will run a study um, on on my behalf. So if I don't have the resources to run them myself, they'll do it for me. So you have numerous options in terms of getting into the clinical research field. And um, I love what I do. And so if I can interest anybody in coming into clinical research, I feel I will have done my job. I love it. Thank you. I think, um, you know, I feel the same way all the time when I um, think about my job and, and working, you know, with kids and in the scientific space, building new devices in the medical space, all of that. It's just so fun. And um, so many perks. You mentioned traveling. I love traveling. I know one of our kids said she loved traveling too. Um, so that's very exciting. But um, does anyone have a question? I know Karen has one in the chat, but I didn't know if anyone had one um, that you wanted to to voice. Um, I have a question. Sure. Do you have any um, like specific, like the most interesting trial you've ever worked on or something like that? Um, I do. So I, I have worked on um, HIV and hepatitis C. 
And the HIV trials were incredibly interesting to me. I had never worked in um, in infectious disease, so I was learning a lot. And it was um, it was very much a learning experience because um, the the way that the HIV disease works, the the virus is very different than how um, the disease of cancer impacts your body. And so it took me a long time to, to be able to learn that and understand how, how the virus worked. And sometimes it'll, it mutates and what you're working on and, and the drug that you're taking may not work anymore because the virus has now changed. So that was really um, interesting and I really enjoyed it because it was so different. But I think one of the most rewarding trials that I worked on was hepatitis C. And I worked on um, one of the drugs that was actually considered a cure. Um, and I was visiting one of my childhood friends in Montana, of all places, in Helena, Montana. We went to this small little art opening, this art gallery opening of a friend of his. And I got to talking to one of the gentlemen who attended, and I told him what I did. And he asked me if it was the, the drug that I had worked on. And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, it was. And he had shared with me that his best friend participated in the trial and that it literally saved his life and that it was an absolute game changer for him, that he, the previous treatment for hepatitis C was horrible. And it made you feel like you had a horrible flu for two weeks every month. And now with taking the, the drug that, that I had worked on, he had his life back. He could go back to work on a regular basis. He could go out with friends. He um, could do all the things that he loved to do. And I think that was probably my most rewarding moment in, in what I do was knowing that something that I had done, seeing the impact that it had in, in, in the real world and, you know, in a patient. And I mean, it was his best friend, but just hearing about that just made me feel like for everything that I do and all the, the challenges that I face, this is why I do what I do. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. I have to say, you know, even if I have a tangential um, role in something that helps somebody one day in the real world, it always makes me feel so happy that I've been able to help in some small way with make a difference in the life of someone. Um, okay, so Karen had a question in chat and she said, can you speak to how bioinformatics fits into this landscape and what does it and when does it come into the process? So bioinformatics comes into the process throughout the, the duration of the development. You're, you can use bioinformatics when you're um, doing your preclinical work, um, when you're in, in the lab, like what um, Kateri does. You can be looking at it as you're um, collecting data. And then um, if you're planning a clinical trial, so there's a lot of um, what they call AI or artificial information that you're looking at as well. So sometimes um, an FDA is kind of warming up to, to this where you can take data from, so say I'm gonna do a trial in, um, in having your, a sore throat. So you can take data from other companies that have done clinical studies in the same sore throat that you wanna look at, and you can apply that to your study to show that the, the way that you wanna run your study will turn out the same way as theirs. And so instead of having to go through the entire drug development process of phase one, phase two, phase three, you might be able to skip some parts of the phase one and then go right into the next, the next step. So there's a lot of different ways that, um, that bioinformatics is being used and the, the treatment landscape is changing rapidly. And there's so much technology and ways to use information um, to understand diseases and different types of treatment. It's, it's really a very exciting time to be in science right now in any area, really. Completely agree. And Anthony, I think this is your cue to talk about some of the data scientists and informatics and things that you do, because um, it's so interesting. Yeah, I think um, this is uh, promises to be, um, I think, uh, a golden era for clinical medicine healthcare. 
with um, so many new technologies, uh, especially um, data science, artificial intelligence. So it's far beyond biomedical informatics. It's actually building on informatics to use data science to really um, get new knowledge from the data. And especially with other technologies like uh, wearable technology, sensors, um, uh, and uh, extended reality, um, artificial intelligence is really going to sort of amplify the benefits of all of these other areas as well. So you can be a, a data scientist and really save, literally save lives by finding information to help patients and help the clinicians to help patients. So um, I always tell my data scientists that that um, they can save lives without going to medical school. And a small cohort of us actually um, are trained in both areas. So that's uh, also very gratifying to take a clinical problem on the front lines of healthcare in the clinic or in the hospital setting and directly translate that into a, a problem that you can solve with data science. So um, it's a very, very special time in medicine right now mm -hmm. in healthcare. Oh, I completely agree. And I love that you just said you don't have to be get a medical uh, degree to be in healthcare and help do these kind of things. I mean, me, Braj, Kateri, none of us have uh, medical degrees, right? But we all kind of play in this field and get a chance to, to make a difference in the healthcare space. And I think that that's really cool. Um, does anyone have any questions? Y'all don't be shy. Speak up. Diego, go ahead. I have a question for uh, Dr. Chang. Um, hi. Right, so I have this project. It's a it's a machine learning algorithm. It's able to diagnose different skin ailments. Yes. Some that are cancerous. Um, I finished it, but I'm trying to. I'm using a data set from Google APIs, and I want to know if you have know of any better data sets I could use to train the model. Yeah, there. Um... Not many publicly available data sets yet in healthcare and clinical medicine, but it's definitely growing. Um, there is um, um, actually, it's it's a publicly available data set under, if you Google, um, I think publicly available healthcare data, I think there's a, a, a website that has um, what's available um, listed, but probably, some of the big healthcare uh, systems like Stanford um, will have more and more data sets available in the next year or two. So just keep an eye out for uh, Stanford's publicly available data set. And I think um, everyone, I'm the privileged um, convener of uh, centers that do AI medicine. And I think everyone's realizing that we have to have some big data sets available to, to allow the public to help uh, make a contribution. So um, there'll, there'll definitely be more and more coming uh, in the next year or two. Okay, thank you so much. In addition to that, Diego, I'm not sure exactly where you're located, but if you reach out to a academic uh, medical center that is doing research and which you're interested in, let them know where you are with your project. They may be able to hire you on as an intern, which would then give you access to that information. Any other questions? This is probably too big of a topic for this <laughs> group, but I'm wondering if um, Anthony or any of you can speak to ethics and how that factors into this field. So I actually work in bioethics. Um, I'm one of the co-directors for our center um, and we do bioethics and health equity consults to individuals on a daily basis throughout the School of Medicine. Um, it is something that we are um, growing and this is actually a novel program. Um, we're one of the first CTSAs um, in the country to actually provide bioethics and health equity consults to physicians as well as clinicians as they're working throughout the uh, translational process. In this, um, it is definitely a very important aspect of the sciences because 
in providing um, care and services and resolve. We also need to make sure that we're doing it at the highest standards and ethics um, available to us. Um, it is always important that we keep the uh, patient or the participant at the forefront of our mind and safety is number one. Um, in addition to safety, there are also blind spots within all of us because we are human and because of that, um, we have created, again, this particular model and this consultation service to answer those questions. So, um, for example, there was a physician a few weeks ago that reached out to us. They are doing research. Um, they've done research in an animal model that has been approved to be done in a human model, but the uh, physician has not had any previous um, human subject experience. And so they wanted to know ethically, how could they move forward? And what were some of the things that they can do to um, beef up per se their research team to ensure that they would not come into any hurdles um, ethically when working in the human subjects um, since they had been previously only working in animal models. Um, but then specifically because they were gonna be working in a minoritized and a um, disabled group, we specifically had to ensure that they knew exactly what they were doing. So then we worked with um, the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, to ensure that they had the um, trainings that they needed, but also they'll be working alongside with my team throughout the process. So if there are any questions that come up, they have a direct link to someone who has backgrounds in the uh, bioethics aspect as well. I, I um... Karen, if you're also referring to ethics of using AI in clinical medicine and healthcare, I'm actually um, one of several people working on a book in this area because it's kind of a brand new area. Um, so ethics, when people talk about ethics in AI and healthcare, they usually feel like um, we need to be careful with um, the AI kind of taking over healthcare and and maybe perpetuating biases or inequities in healthcare, um, which I think is, is a focus when you talk about ethics in healthcare. But rarely does anyone talk about the ethics of not applying AI appropriately in situations. And that's why I really get um, a little bit more vocal about the ethics of not deploying AI that's readily available and that's proven to make a difference already which I think them was demonstrated throughout the pandemic that there are some tools available. And I think people are starting to be a little bit more open-minded about both sides of ethics of AI and healthcare. That um, that, you know, while we focus mainly on the ethics of, of using AI and healthcare, but we rarely, if ever, talk about the ethics of not deploying AI when it can be a very, very useful tool. So you'll see a trend towards discussing, you know, not using a, a tool that can really help save lives. Um, so that's, to me, that's also unethical. So we have to balance the discussion. And then I'll just add on the last piece about ethics, which um, I'm not sure ties into your question, but in terms of clinical trials, um, in order for us to be able to work with um, a large hospital like Northwestern or Stanford, um, we have to get our study approved by what we call the IRB or the Institutional Review Board or the Ethics Committee. And what they do is that they're looking at um, our consent form to make sure that it fully um, informs the, the patients of what they're signing up for. They review um, what we call our protocol, which outlines exactly what we're going to do and why we do it to make sure that it meets all of the criteria for clinical research. Um, so we do go through <clears throat> an ethics review to make sure that um, all of the, the drug companies that are doing research are on the up and up and that are conducting their trial per all of the regulations and guidelines um, and are um, doing so, again, just like Kateri, I'm, Kateri, I'm just going to keep quoting you all, all morning, um, really with the, the patient in mind and being patient focused um, to make sure that, that they're getting what they need um, without there being any um, biases or any risks, um, un any untoward risks to them.
All right. Um, anyone else have a question? We've had some people stay quiet the whole time, which is okay. Um, but if you have a question, feel free to plop it in chat or ask it. And Diego, I know you saw that where Dr. Chang put a link in for you um, for data. So I think that's really cool. And then, you know what, Anthony, when, when Diego asked that question, the other thing that I thought about was um, Tim's moonshot. And I thought maybe if you wanted to talk about that a little bit, kind of talking about how we're starting to try to collect that data for people to use and be able to, to do these types of things. Yeah, um, I'm partner with Tim Cho, who is a Silicon Valley um, cloud computing expert and trying to find, and, and to his credit, he, um, he was my professor at Stanford when I was in the program and we kept uh, our relationship that eventually evolved into a friendship as well. But um, he's uh, asked me, what are some big, big <laughs> problems in healthcare? And I said, well, just simply not being able to share data or share information across continents and across oceans. And um, so he didn't realize that healthcare was so far behind other sectors in our society in terms of uh, not only sharing data, but also using data science. So we came up with a model that will enable us, as a matter of fact, it's very timely because this coming Friday, we will be transmitting an echo in real time to another children's hospital um, in Rome. So it'll be Orange County to Rome. And, um, and then if we can transmit data in terms of an um, ultrasound um, study of the heart, then we can also transmit um, data science findings of that echo information. So. Um, this Friday we'll be launching that connection. Um, it just happens that there's personal meaning for me too because uh, we needed a, a, a child with congenital heart disease as a as a study subject, and my um, my oldest daughter has congenital heart disease, so we actually will be able to transmit her echo from Orange County, California, to Rome. And then they'll be transmitting an echo back to us. So it's pretty exciting. It's it's like the beginning of a, a pediatric internet that hopefully will lead to many, many connections and many, many ways of using data science so that someday, we hope, by the end of the decade, almost for sure, um, Leanne and her group in Atlanta should be able to um, shared the information and the insight of a a child's you know um study of any kind to hospitals and doctors and nurses um, from around the world to hopefully solve a a case that's very very difficult uh almost instantaneously so it's really really exciting that uh, we're going to start with two connections and hopefully uh, by the end of the decade there'll be millions of connections just like the internet Anthony, congratulations. That's amazing. I want to know, are you all doing um, some type of documentation or uh, of this process to commemorate this? Yeah, we, um, well, not in terms of the press, but <laughs> um, but in terms of um, using this model, uh, and it's the beauty of a clinician working closely with a technologist, because Tim had probably didn't have um, any idea that the value of this is not just transmitting information, but for clinicians to learn together. Mm -hmm. So we actually are building a what's called a federated learning model off of this connection, which means that you can share what you know without sharing the da patient data, which tends to be uh, sometimes uh, an obstacle that clinicians hesitate to, to do in, in a joint project like this. So if you don't have to share the patient's uh, data, then clinicians are always up for collaborating. So, um, so this will facilitate learning for clinicians because you don't have to share the patient data. And someone asked me, you know, can you explain that in layman terms? And I said, it's, um, you know, I've, I've been privileged to work at some of the largest and best children's hospitals and heart programs. And it's kind of like, me going around and learning from each center 
um, and then bring what I've learned to the next place that I, I work. And as you know, I, I share my lessons learned, but I never take the patient data with me. So it's kind of like that in the way that you share what everyone is learning and, and potentially can, can also teach without sharing patients data. So that's a game changer as far as I'm concerned in terms of um, doing clinical research. So I think um, the future of clinical research is going to be very um, real time and very real world. And um, to, out, out of total respect for anyone in research now, but the, but the concept of, um, and perhaps we can talk about this, the concept of randomized controlled trials will probably not be as, as practical or popular in the next coming decades uh, because the, the world has changed in terms of, of dealing with um, data. You know, the other thing I think about too, when you talk about this sharing of data across the world, and um, doctors learning from each other, but it's also an opportunity for um, a diagnosis or some medical help for a kid in an area that may not have a specialist, but then there's another specialist somewhere else in the world that can help, you know, diagnose and solve the problem for that kid. I, I think there's so many yeah, advantages. Exactly. Well, yeah. Tim, would, Tim tells the story uh, of how frustrated I was when I was doing a consult on a child in Myanmar which uh, also was known as Burma. Um, and I left the country and within a few months, that child um, ended up dying because I think there was some information that was not able to be shared. And I was so frustrated that if I had just had access to some information, we could have made a big difference. So, uh, and that child's name, first name is, is um, Elsie. And I've never forgotten that name because I felt like if we only had a way to share information, you know, in real time, we could have saved that kid's life, and and that inspired both me and Tim to to have a technological solution to a problem that clinicians face every single hour around the world that that they don't have access to the right experts. Um, and somewhere, someone around the world is going to be available to, to help you with a case, right, at any given time. Uh, and the beauty of having different time zones is that someone's going to be up <laughs> in the middle of the night. So my my dream is someday any any kid from around the world with a with a tough problem can get experts to help at any given time. Either reading an X ray or reading a sophisticated ultrasound study or solving a problem. Even that there'll be a giant um, brain trying to solve all the problems. Me too. I hope I hope for that too. Um, all right, y'all, we're kind of getting close to the end of time. Does anyone have another question? Feel free to ask. We have three really awesome people here who can answer your questions. And don't be shy. All right. So let me do this. So Braze or Kateri or Anthony, is there anything you want to kind of say in closing that you really want these kids to know? The one thing that I would say is because you're here, you're naturally curious and you like to learn. And so I would take advantage of exploring all different opportunities within science and technology and engineering because you never know where it could take you. And there are so many different opportunities and options. Um, and like I was saying, you know, the the medical field is changing so rapidly and all of you have the opportunity to make a huge difference. So keep exploring, keep learning, keep asking questions. Um, don't be afraid. If something doesn't make sense to you, don't be afraid to say, you know what, I don't think that's right. And here's what I, th here's what I think it is because you just never know. So that's what I, that's my parting, my parting thought. Awesome. Thanks. Say continue to ask the questions and use the resources that you have. You have us as a resource. Reach out to us. As I mentioned, I started out in a lab at LSU School of Medicine at age 14, and I am still in contact with my first mentor, Dr. Carl P. Johnson, till this day. Um, he's been one resource that I've used throughout my academic and career life, and it's a relationship that I 
again, that has involved similar as Tim mentioned, it was a, a mentor of mine, a professor, and now he's a colleague of mine. So stay in contact with those individuals because they are um, your, your life links. They are a part of your story. And also, if you're interested in doing research at any point, um, reach out to me. I do have several um, opportunities within my lab, but also throughout Feinberg School of Medicine. So I would definitely love to stay in contact with you all and provide you opportunities as well. But just again, remain curious, um, stay in contact with your resources. I am here and I know everyone else on this call would definitely feel the same way. Um, we are here to make sure that you do succeed and you are the next generation that will continue the work that we're doing today. I guess I'm the oldest, so I'll have the, the last takeaway, but um, by far actually looks like. Um, well, three takeaways. One is we're in a public health crisis right now not and i'm not talking about the pandemic that's a relatively small crisis compared to the real crisis underneath and that is that we're going to have a shorter life expectancy for the first time in many decades partly because of the pandemic but mostly because of the health inequities that are exaggerated because of the pandemic so i think everyone should realize that there's a public health crisis that's going to need many of us, many more of us to be involved to help everyone. So um, that's one. The second is that there are more senior people leaving medicine. I mean, doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists than ever before. And about a third, a quarter to a third will be gone in five years. So when you see an, a, a senior doctor or a nurse, um, realize that one out of three of them will not be here within five years, which is also now creating a, a, a human power shortage in a, in a big way. So the good news with that is more young students have applied to medical schools than ever before, despite knowing that frontline clinicians can lose their lives, uh, which is so inspiring for me. So, um, realize that there's gonna be a tremendous man and woman power shortage in the coming decades, which exaggerates the, the public health crisis even more. But I wanna end on a very positive note, and that is um, my own seven-year-old who just walked by wondering uh, when we're gonna have breakfast. Uh, <laughs> um, so, but um, she is, oh, oh she heard me. <laughs> um, she told me a year and a half ago that she wants to be a, a pediatric cardiologist and data scientist. And um, so she inspires, wave, wave hello. Um, so she, um, okay. So she um, inspires me on a daily basis that we need to create healthcare and leave a really much better platform for her because her clinical career is going to be much tougher than mine, given all the challenges that we have. But perhaps um, we could look at mentorship as, you know, circular in that young people will inspire and mentor senior people and vice versa. That I spend a lot of time with young people throughout the year. And it's a constant reminder for me that we need to work harder to make everything better for them. But at the same time, they also teach us uh, many things that are um, very, very valuable for, for older people to understand and know. So just because you're younger, please don't feel like the teaching is always um, one direction. You can teach um, older people a lot of things as well. So it's a circular mentorship. Well, and I'll say just, you know, everything we do at ICANN is to give um, our youth a chance to talk and share and educate uh, doctors and people in industry and people in the regulatory sciences and things like that. So I think that that's so true, Anthony, and so wonderful. And I'm gonna give everybody one last chance to ask a question if you want. Um, we have like two minutes left. All right. I, was I, I, I have one quick question. Okay. Can I ask it as a non-kiddo? Yeah. Always a kiddo at heart. This is also a big topic. I'm wondering if anybody can speak. I worked on a, uh, uh, with a company related to virtual reality and XR. Wondering how that specifically fits into clinical trials and 
any of this. Can anybody briefly speak to that and the potential of that? There's a lot, it's very nascent, it's loaded and it's complicated, but. Yes, all of those things. And um, I can't speak for any other companies, but I know that um, we are, and specifically myself, um, have explored different areas within the virtual reality space um, for different purposes. So there's one platform, it's called Verbella. Um, and what they do is really neat. They create avatars um, and you, you get to dress yourself and you know figure out what your hair looks like. You can even make the avatar dance, which is like my favorite part. But um, you can set up different scenarios. So one of the scenarios that we worked on was having um, an avatar patient in a doctor's office and asking questions about the study. And so <clears throat> it's an opportunity to learn more about the trial um, on the patient's own time. So if they go to the site and they're, they go through the, the screen visit, they sign the consent form, and then they go home and they're reading the consent form again and they have additional questions, now they have the opportunity to log into this particular platform um, and then ask more questions about the study or the consent form or any of the assessments that are being conducted. So there, there definitely are areas in clinical research where um, it is being used, but I think um, in some aspects, it's still very new. Um, just trying to figure out from a you know, patient confidentiality perspective and, and you know, how you're trying to, to implement it within that, that clinical trial space. You know, I'll also add, Karen, I mean, I think that Braish probably answered your question, but this might be interesting to other people. So um, AR, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality are being used um, sometimes as the treatment, um, sometimes as a distraction to something that might be painful during a treatment. Um, it can also be used to help train the people who are going to do the trial in some motions or activities that they need to do. So there's all sorts of really cool things happening in augmented reality and virtual reality in the healthcare space. Anyone else have anything they wanna ask or say before we hop off? All right, we are so happy that everybody joined us today. I think that was a really great discussion and we love all of our guest speakers and all of our kids who showed up and um, y'all have a great weekend and we will see you next month. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Bye.